Washington County's involvement with this before I turn it over to Shweta Murthy, who is our researcher for this project from Coalition of Communities of Color. In 2016, the executive director of the Coalition of Communities of Color, who was then Julia Meyer, approached a number of us in the uh, public sector out in Washington County about um, the possibility of supporting this project. Uh, they were interested in starting a research project and were asking us to help fund it, but also to participate in the leadership of that. And we were very happy to do so. Um, for those of you who have uh, read the report, it is available online. Here's a copy of the executive summary. Um, most of the cities and some of the special districts in the county all uh, participated in supporting this study, I'm grateful to say. So two of us from Washington County sat on the steering committee and supported the work of the coalition. Um, the two representatives were myself and Jenny Proctor from Community Development, who's here in the audience today. Jenny, thank you for your commitment to this over the last couple of years. We felt that this project was going to be an important impetus to start conversations here in Washington County about racial justice. And we felt it was important for Washington County to be at the table. Ultimately, we seek to work with our partners on collective action. You, for those of us you ha who haven't read the report yet, at the end there is a call to action. And that's the uh, focus of our work moving forward is to look at what the calls to action ask of us and figure out how we implement or operationalize those calls to action here at Washington County. Um, in the meantime, today is a chance for us to hear what the study tells us. Um, Shweta will do a wonderful job of presenting an overview of the research project, and it will ground us in the results of that study. So I hope you take advantage of the chance to learn from and hear from our community partners and experts in this, in this field. But ultimately, I hope the challenge to all of us is to take this back to our departments and start the conversations there about what these calls to action call on us to do. So our charge is to figure out how to move this forward from here. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Shweta and she will tell you about this study. Hi everyone. Uh... Thanks for the introduction, Sia. Uh, my name is Shweta Murthy, and I'm the research director at the Coalition of Communities of Color. Uh, for those of you who don't know the coalition, oh, by the way, sound check, can everybody hear me? Cool. Um, thank you from the back. <laughs> uh, the Coalition of Communities of Color is an alliance of 19 culturally specific organizations that uh, comprise of and work with communities of color uh, with a mission for racial justice transformation in, um, in Oregon and the Portland uh, metro area. So before I uh, talk to you about uh, the project itself, um, I wanna share with you a little bit about how I'll be spending uh, my presentation time today. I wanna share with you a little bit about uh, the research work at the coalition and how it informed uh, the research design for this project. I want to share with you some qualitative and quantitative findings from the Leading with Race report. And then lastly, I want to present to you uh, some of the calls to action, uh, the calls to action that Sia referred to in her introduction. All right, so the uh, coalition, um, we set up the research program uh, in 2016, and uh, we really asked ourselves, uh, how does research look uh, when it's done by a community organization, when it's done by an organization of color, right? And when we, uh, as we were having that conversation, we talked about the idea of research, that in order for research to be in service of justice, we needed to apply a justice lens to research itself and see what comes up, right? And what came up for us were these two questions, that when we start applying a justice lens to research, it fundamentally brings up two questions about research. One is who has been researched historically and in current practices, and two, who has done the researching, right? And when we ask these two questions, they became really fundamental to our understanding of how research can be in service of justice. So our, uh, our research justice vision really tackles these two questions 
and says that research in uh, order to be service of justice needs to be just itself. And the way in which uh, that works for us is that we think of communities of color as having three rights when it comes to uh, research practices and research processes. One is the right to research itself, which is basically this idea that communities of color, traditionally those who've been the researched, have the right to self-determine their research agenda, what are, the, uh, what are the questions, concerns, and priorities that are important for communities of color to have research done on in order to improve our outcomes and outcomes for communities around us. The second is the right to be heard, which is the idea that communities of color have experiential, cultural, and historical knowledge which is typically dismissed by mainstream research practices as well as mainstream policy making as emotional and anecdotal. And for communities of color to actually have that knowledge be heard as data, as evidence, and as legitimate research. The third uh, is, the, is for communities of color having the right to know. For many of you in this room, you all know that there's tons of data, there's tons of research that exists about uh, equity outcomes, about health practices, about uh, criminal justice outcomes for communities of color and so on. But it's not actually accessible to many communities. Uh, and these barriers could be that of jargon, it could be that of being classified information, it could be because uh, data is just plain and simple inaccessible to communities of color. And so we think that communities of color actually have the right to know the data and research that exists about them on the basis of which decisions and policies are made all the time. And furthermore, it's at the intersection of these three rights, the right to research, the right to be heard, and the right to know that true research justice can exist, that true decolonization of data and research can exist, where research is not just in service of justice, but where, uh, where research is just itself. And that's the phrase of research justice that we hold true to our uh, beliefs and practices of how to do good research around social justice issues. And it's not something that we came up with on our own. There's an entire national and international movement of people who do research justice in these ways. So I want to share with you a little bit about how this research justice vision informed the Leading with Race uh, Research Justice in Washington County project. So we distilled uh, a few principles from, uh, from this research justice principle. One is positioning communities of color as experts in their lived experience. It's, it feels trite to say, but nobody knows better than people of color how institutional racism impacts our daily lived experiences. The second uh, was positioning communities of color as researchers rather than the objects of research inquiry, sort of really up, uh, upturning and flipping over uh, dominant practices of seeing communities of color as subjects of research, not as researchers themselves. Related to that was uh, thinking, it, uh, thinking it valuable to provide opportunities to communities of color to conduct critical inquiry about their lived experiences in, uh, in the research process. And then through all of that, thinking it really valuable that the research project and research projects become opportunities to counter dominant culture narratives for communities of color. How that got operationalized in the research process itself is that we had a steering committee that CR referred to, which comprised of culturally specific organizations that are based in Washington County, as well as culturally specific organizations who aren't yet based in Washington County, but whose communities live in this, uh, in this region. The steering committee also had local governments, such as the Washington County government, the cities of Beaverton, Hillsboro, Tiger, Tualatin, Cornelius, and Forest Grove, as well as some school districts who had the capacity to participate at that time. And this steering committee uh, decided uh, convened every, uh, every other month over two years, decided uh, the research agenda, of what the report should look like, what the report should contain, uh, as well as uh, the collective process of deciding and crafting the calls to action. The research process also contained uh, community conversations and focus groups with eight communities of color that live in Washington County. 
we uh, we treated these uh, community conversations not just as passive uh, sort of one way extractions of tell us how your life is in, is is uh, impacted by racism in Washington County type conversations, but really as work sessions where communities got together shared the, uh, interacted with the data that exists about their communities in Washington County that, uh, that talked about their short-term to long-term priorities uh, in Washington County and crafting some community solutions around those issue areas. We also had a community review process um, in the research process. Once, uh, once the report was drafted, uh, we resourced community members to uh, look at the report again and to provide us critical feedback on uh, the content of the report. And uh, that's what made uh, the report 384 pages long, because there was a lot of feedback. And uh, we really did this community review process because, again, we see and uh, we start with the premise that communities are experts of, our lived ex of their lived experience. So, of course, they should have the right to review and provide critical feedback on the report that's being written about them. And lastly, we, are, uh, we inbuilt into the research process opportunities for presentation and post-report uh, publication advocacy, such as uh, spaces like this, where we invite uh, community leaders and community members to uh, to present the research project. Uh, the research was published in June, and from June to December, we have had at least 15 to 20 community members uh, who have come along with us for research presentations, who've, uh, who've stood along with us and presented the research as experts of that report. All right, real quickly, I'm not gonna go through uh, the goals of the research report, uh, but suffice it to say, this research was never intended to just be for research sake. It is intended for action. It is intended for, for transformation from uh, uh, beginning from providing baseline knowledge about communities of color that live in Washington County uh, to improving public investment and policies and services uh, for communities of color that live in this region. What's in the report uh, are eight community narratives of eight communities of color that live in Washington County. It comprises qualitative narratives as well as quantitative data that has been critiqued and contextualized by community members who participated in the report. Uh, the steering committee told uh, us very early that what happens in Washington County is experienced and felt differently in different jurisdictions in Washington County. So we have four quantitative data snapshots of the eight communities that live in Hillsborough, Beaverton, Cornelius and Forest Grove, and Tiger Tualatin and Sherwood. And of course, there's the calls to action at the end. All right, I wanna share with you real briefly uh, three qualitative uh, findings from the report. Also, just want to say it's really, really awkward sitting and doing this presentation. <laughs> it's very, very weird. Um, I'm having to control my physical movements a lot. All right, so uh, the first uh, cross-cultural finding that came up across eight communities that live in Washington County are this. One, people of color have always lived in Washington County. We are part of the economy and social fabric. We strive to make it our home. It sounds really commonsensical, but it was one of the first dominant culture narratives that came up again and again in various conversations, either in the focus groups as, or, or in one-on-one -on -one interview or ad hoc conversations with community members in Washington County. The fact that uh, the sort of the mainstream adage of Washington County as diversifying as uh, you know the mainstream adages of uh, rapidly changing demographics in Washington County and Oregon for many people of color who participated in this report felt uh, really uh, like a whitewash narrative of, of the history of Oregon of the history of Washington County and really erased uh, one, either generations of community members who've lived in Washington County uh, or uh, really erase sort of the uh, complex and fraught history of Oregon and Washington County from native genocide to anti-black racism and, uh, and really was blinding of 
why many communities of color don't live in Washington County or in Oregon um, if, if they really don't. But overall, there was some strong Washington County pride in, in many uh, spaces that we interacted in. People like living in Washington County. They like sending their kids to school here, and they want to make it their home, and they strive to make it their home. And it felt uh, repetitive for many people to keep on showing that they belong here and that they've lived here for a, for a long time. The second finding that came up across the eight communities was this. Our reality consists of both experiencing oppression by racist institutions and practices and our resilience and resistance to that. We are made to feel both invisible and hypervisible. Compared to uh, their white neighbors, people of color in Washington County talked about uh, experiencing disproportionately negative outcomes in employment, income, education, community, safety, and health. They saw this as a cumulative result of racist institutions and practices like immigration and criminal justice policies, opportunity and achievement gaps of students, and mortgage lending practices. They talked about feeling invisible in different ways because the size of their communities, because of immigration that pushes some communities into the shadows, systemic attempts to kill or exclude certain communities, data practices that don't count communities of color accurately and some communities even more inaccurately than others, and perceptions that some communities don't even belong to the racial justice conversation, that some communities aren't even seen as people of color. Simultaneously, uh, many talked about feeling hyper-visible in different ways, through racial stereotypes about being illegal, criminals or terrorists on the one hand, or quote-unquote positive stereotypes of being model minorities on the other. The third finding that came up uh, through this report, uh, again, so somewhat unsurprisingly to many uh, people of color who participated in, in this or who have read it since then, is that communities of color talked about being experts in our lived experience. There's an, there's an adage in disability justice that says nothing about us without us, right? This idea that policies that impact people of color cannot be made or uh, reformed or reviewed without those most impacted in decision-making tables. And uh, that came up again and again across the eight communities that participated in this project, which is see us as experts in our lived experience, see our potential, see the solutions that already exist in our communities, see the expertise that already exists in our communities, and that Washington County would be better by working together as a result. Some quantitative data findings uh, that came up in this report were, one, that Vietnamese and Filipino workers have lower incomes at similar levels of education as white workers in Washington County. High-income home loan applicants who are black are 86% more likely, and Latino applicants are 125% more likely to have their home loan applications denied compared to high-income white potential homeowners. Somali-speaking students are 197% more likely than white students to be expelled or suspended from school. And 68% of Native American single moms are in poverty in Washington County, a higher rate compared to 48% of Native American single moms in poverty in the United States. So those are some hard numbers that we are living with in Washington County. I want to share with you some uh, community voices that, uh, that came through uh, this report. And they're color-coded uh, to, uh, to, to reflect that these voices came from, from different people in different communities. People have to know, because they really don't know anything about us and the history of the area. We've become invisible. There are books available that could be required reading in schools. Somebody else said, at the schools, if they can find one adult who cares, one person who that student can make a connection with, I think knowing there's somebody at school that's going to talk to them and say, your child is doing great. They can go to college. Instead of earning $12 an hour, they can earn $40 an hour if they go to college. Somebody else said, we need language services to, I don't want to use the phrase fitting in, but to be independent and provide for your family. 
I want to sustain and strengthen my culture rather than be lost and overwhelmed by other cultures. Another community member said, we raise a lot of dollars for our community needs. Indians are very active in temples and stuff like that. But when it comes to politics, we haven't had much of a voice. Another community member said, there is a term I really hate right now, that term of cultural fit. I see that being used a lot to me as a way to keep people out of employment. Let's get together and make sure you're the right cultural fit, right fit for the team. That team is 80% white. You're a natural misfit. Another community resident said, I speak three languages and I'm doing my master's. My boss is over the moon excited I took that job because I'm way overqualified. Why did I take that job? Because there's no way to get the jobs I deserve in this county. So you start applying to those jobs where you have a better chance. And lastly, a community member said, often when you'll walk into one of those local offices and they say, where are you from? Or how are you enjoying our country? There is not that emotional intelligence. You don't just assume because a person is looking a certain way or dressing a certain way. So where do we go from here? Uh, the steering committee spent uh, a reasonable amount of time uh, crafting the calls to action. It was, uh, there were some hard conversations because where we go from here, what we do with this research is where communities of color really place their trust in this project. Given the kind of research, uh, given the kind of skepticism and fatigue and trauma that many communities of color have experienced with mainstream research practices, it's the promise of the calls to action. It's the promise uh, uh, of accountability. It's the promise that the steering committee comprised of people who had and institutions who had the power to make changes, who had the power to craft partnerships that would make the changes is why communities participated in this research process. And so uh, the steering committee came up with uh, eight calls to action. They're all in the executive summary as well as the longer report. So I just want to call out a few. One is that the steering committee really called out the fact that cross-sectoral change needs to happen uh, in, in the cause uh, in order to enable uh, transformational change in Washington County. The realization that communities of color don't live their lives in silos, as do you know, many of you who don't identify as people of color, uh, means that change needs to happen in education, in housing, in criminal justice, in infrastructure simultaneously so that the needles are moving at the same time. And recognizing, in fact, that there are compounding effects of racism that we need to dismantle. The second is that democratic governments, that good governments should collaborate with one another and should really redress the lack of representation amongst communities uh, of color in their spaces. Uh, there, were, uh, there was a call out to equitable economic empowerment and the, the ways in which that, uh, that spans everything from pay equity to, to housing justices, housing justice issues and promoting entrepreneurship. Uh, civic engagement and leadership development was another big call to, call to action and the need for people to make space for communities of color to run for office and to run for leadership. And lastly, uh, was sort of the call for partnership in, in everything, including research and accountability. How are communities of color going to be partners in, uh, in understanding how much the needle has moved from uh, this report going forward and for communities of color to be partners in evaluating what impact this research has had and what change it has, um, it has uh, you know, brought about. So I want to leave this call to action here and invite our panelists uh, who are going to have a discussion on this call to action and how it applies to uh, this work. So um, I think what we'll do is, um, uh, is have the panel introduce themselves and uh, kick us off with um, sort of introductions, name, organization, um, but if you played a role in, in leading with race, and uh, tell us a little bit uh, about um, your work and specifically, um, you know, 
thinking about how one of the findings for the report was recognizing that communities of color are experts and a call for nothing about us without us. So I would love for each of you to speak a little about how that resonates with, with you and your work. So name organization and then a little bit about how that finding resonates with you and your work. So it'll start with Maria okay. and then sort of move that way. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Maria Rubio and I am the executive director. Can everybody hear me, by the way? Okay. Uh, at Centro Cultural. And um, I've been there uh, for three years now. I came back to Washington County in 2015. And I feel, I just want to say, I feel right at home. Um, moved here in 1969 from California. This is home and have and work at one of the, lo um, the longest um, or oldest nonprofits in the state actually, uh, that is a culturally specific organization, which is Centro Cultural. And if you don't know about us, come on over and we'll tell you all about what we do. Uh, we've been in business for the past 46 years to serve the Latino community in particular, uh, low income and non-English speakers to advance and to integrate into the greater community. Over the past three years, we've expanded our role quite a bit and um, are doing a lot more in terms of preparing people for leadership roles and workforce development. Um, I also feel welcome because I worked at in Washington County for 12 years. I was uh, with Washington County Sheriff's Office for nine years as a crime prevention officer and then I was a parole and probation officer for three years before I went on to the state and federal levels. So. Um, I was also part of the steering committee and I participated for two years, two long years, <laughs> with Sweta and with Sia on this committee. And one of the things that was fascinating to me was to see everybody at the table. It wasn't just communities of color commiserating and talking about things and trying to figure out how do we get a place at the table, but it was people of power at the table as well. It was, it was government, it was city, and um, everyone, I feel, was very well represented. And I really want to, um, to thank those, um, those jurisdictions that paid into this process. It was a long process, but it, I think it was very, very well worth it. When Shweta asked about uh, nothing without us, nothing about us without us, uh, brought to mind when we, part of what the work that we did as communities of color was to do some focus groups and get information, just do the research with our communities. And I got two responses when I invited people. The first response was, not again. We're so tired of telling our story over and over and over again for decades and nothing changes. That was one of the responses. The other response was excitement. People were excited after we talked about this whole process um, that maybe this time something would come from the research, something would come from participating on these uh, focus groups and, and other activities. Um, I think um, communities of color, in particular I'm talking about the Latino community, we've been here for a long time, as have others. Um, but we were one of those communities that felt invisible. But we were also the community who felt hyper-visible because uh, whenever it's a negative thing, we're hyper-visible. And uh, whenever there are, there are policy decisions and, and things that impact our community, we are not visible, we're not accounted for. So that's why I'm really excited about this process and the research. And I also want to challenge you as uh, government employees to know who lives here, who lives in Washington County, who are these people, what do they, what are their needs, what 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 is their culture? I think it's it's um, our responsibility, and I'm putting myself as a government employee for a moment, um, ex-employee, for us not only the leadership but also at your level to know who these who we are as a community and do our best to be entrepreneurs within our system because we can and we do have the flexibility to make those decisions at certain levels and I think that I'm challenging you to learn from this research and to go back and integrate it and use it when you can. Feel free to come to us and ask us questions, uh, make recommendations and so forth. We're in it for the long run and we hope that you are too. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Robin Yi. Uh, I go by he and his pronouns. I'm the lead political organizer at APANO, which is the Asian Pacific American Network of Oregon. Um, it's really great to see everyone here. I think change feels really possible when we see this room of folks who are interested in, in learning about it. Um, 
Uh, at Apano, uh, I lead the, our political advocacy and civic engagement efforts. We're coming off of uh, that election that happened a few weeks ago, if people remember that. Uh, and uh, you know, heading into the legislative session, we do a lot to uh, bring more people into our civic life, especially people who are you know, just often ignored for uh, discriminatory racist reasons and also people who just need um, to overcome some barriers to uh, be a part of their community, right? Who, who live here, who are um, active participants, who make this county beautiful. Uh, they just wanna be a part of it. So that's that's the mission that we see. Uh, we're also uh, you know, center organizing at our organization. So we're community organizers, we're narrative shifters, but we do a lot of uh, cultural narrative work to make sure that you know things like data um, have a narrative with it, right? Because data without a narrative is just numbers at best, and it could be a tool of oppression at its worst, which we've seen in the past. Um, but you know, I was uh, part of this project as a community participant. I grew up in Beaverton. Um, I'm of this county, uh, uh, and it was um, a different experience than any other kind of focus group been asked to be a part of before, because we. Uh, were treated not of, as objects of inquiry, as Ritza said, but as folks who knew exactly what we needed to drive for. Um, and we would be in charge of owning the narrative and uh, making sure that through presentations like this, we actually have um, actionable steps, right, to move forward. The last thing we want to do is make people feel like they wasted their time again, convincing people of a story that we know really well, that um, but we need to convince like people who can you know, do something about it to act on it. So you know, at Apano, we tell people to tell your own story, or else someone else will tell it for you. So um, we we also um, know that oftentimes um, for you know we work with the Asian, Asian American, and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities that uh, we're often seen as like perpetual foreigners, um, even though we know from this report that uh, close to what 95% of all uh, like youth and students who are currently in Washington County are U.S. citizens, right? So we're trying to combat dangerous uh, stereotypes of who it is that is in this county or who belongs, right? Who is of this county. And uh, for me, growing up in Beaverton, uh, my family moved here in 2001. Uh, it was, uh, I never doubted for a second that there were other uh, people of color. You know, I was, uh, grew up in the Chinese community. Um, but what I didn't know was whether how I looked like or uh, what languages my family spoke at home, if that would be a feature or a flaw, if that would stop me from achieving the things that I wanted, or uh, if it was gonna lead to my downfall, right, because of what you know, whatever opportunities were limited. So um, I think we have a lot of work to do to make sure that people don't question that, uh, that people know that who they are um, and you know, how they came to this county doesn't matter. It's, or it does matter, but it's about how we move forward, making sure that um, we can have great lives in this county that we all choose to live in, right, a lot of folks. Uh, what the report said is like, we fundamentally like Washington County, we want to see it be better, and we want to be partners in this, um, in this movement for change, and we can do that together. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. It's an honor and privilege to be with you all today. It's exciting to see so many folks here and the enthusiasm. Uh, my name is Tony DeFalco. I'm the executive director at Verde. Verde is a nonprofit based in Northeast Portland that focuses on building environmental wealth in communities. And we do that through outreach, advocacy, and social enterprises. We operate two social enterprises, a commercial landscaping firm and a general contractor. Uh, a couple of recent highlights for us, recently finished building Coley Park, uh, transforming a 25-acre landfill in Northeast Portland to a park in a very park-deficient neighborhood. Um, and I. I wanted to reflect on a couple of things. One is that I, I have more ties to Washington County than I thought as I was driving over here. My sister's lived here for the past five years. She's really into Washington County because she was living uh, in Beaverton and now she lives in Buxton. And I was wondering how many people know where Buxton is. <laughs> Look at that. We got like five or six people. So um, I'll be uh, visiting uh, all of Washington County and unincorporated Washington County a lot more. Um, and then I'm also a, a bird watcher. So um, you all have some of the, some of the best bird watching spots in the, in the Tri-County area. Fern Hill is one of my favorite places to go bird watching. So thanks for taking care of the birds over here. Um, and so my reflection on the question around 
um, you know, uh, not so much about um, accountability, but about setting the agenda. And I think for us in the work that we do uh, over the last 13 years as an organization um, and as a member organization of the coalition has been to front uh, and center people of color in the decision-making roles for environmental agendas. And that has ranged from parks to climate to uh, cleanup, uh, all the various kinds of environmental issues that, um, that we as uh, nonprofits and government institutions face. And um, the two, I'll give you two quick examples. One we did with City of Tiger recently where the City of Tiger asked us to help and uh, uh, design a park in an uh, incorporated um, Tiger Metzger Park. And so community members that we centered in designing Coley Park in Northeast Portland came and talked peer to peer with community members in uh, Unincorporated Tiger, talking about how do you want this park to look. That design is carried forward into how that park will then look. And there is an overt emphasis on engaging that community longer term in other park designs in the city so that those parks reflect the values and needs and priorities of low income people and people of color. And so I think that's a really good example. Another one is working with Metro, regional government, uh, a project called Connect with Nature, and specifically uh, East Council Creek and Cornelius, and looking at kind of similar, how do you use, how do you use the knowledge that's in um, low income and people of color communities to design open spaces to meet the needs of those communities and all the things that go with that. And whether that's transit or economic opportunity, those often come into play when you think about things like natural resources. So for me, it's just simply, whatever your department, whatever your role, how are you centering communities of color uh, and low-income community voices in deciding how are we going to do this work, who is going to benefit from this work, and how will we have long-term sustainability of the participation of those communities in continuing to set the agenda for that work. So again, thanks for the opportunity to be here. And again, my name is Cia Lindstrom. Um, I've been with Washington County over 10 years now, and um, I'm honored to be on this panel. I am here to be the voice of the Washington County organization, which is a little intimidating since you all are also the voice of Washington County organization. And so um, I know anything I say uh, during this presentation, you all have to come tell me afterwards what I should have said. So that's my challenge to you. Um, I have uh, had a long commitment to uh, work toward the arc of racial justice as part of my uh, professional career, and I saw this as an important piece of that work that we are all doing together. Um, the idea um, that Shweta put in front of us to speak about in terms of nothing about us without us, I think, is a really important concept. Um, I think we can all resonate with that idea. Right? Uh, none of us like it when something is imposed on us without our input. Um, it's in, I think it's an important, a particularly important concept for those of us working in government. Um, unfortunately, government re uh, regulation has been used as a mechanism to impose structural racism for a long time. Um, since before our government's inception even. And so uh, Oregon in particular has a, a long and difficult history of mandating exclusion of people of color. And so we have a lot of work to do in government to overcome that history. I think that's a challenge for, for all of us. Um, and so that idea that um, we make sure that nothing about us without us in terms of our work toward racial justice is something um, that we incorporate into everything we do. I think it's, it's a mandate for those of us in government to make sure that that happens. Cool. Thank you. Um, so a couple of ideas uh, came up around um, um, sort of the agenda setting piece about accountability, about the role of government in um, um, in doing sort of your part in dismantling sort of racist institutions and practices that exist within. So I want to kind of have you all think about uh, or tell us a little bit more about that in terms of what is the role and power you see uh, that Washington County has, Washington County, the government, um, has in implementing the calls to action that are that are in this report. And you've all touched on it a little bit, but I was hoping that you could go a little bit deeper. Um, any one of you can. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think as one of the 
the funders for this research. I think Washington County, because you rep represent everyone in Washington County, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, would be that you should take the lead. You should take the lead in looking to uh, prioritize what some of the recommendations are and what fits and what can move forward. Um, I believe that as the largest government agency, it's it's um, our your responsibility to to regardless how, ta how tax dollars are prioritized within the county to share that information with communities of color and get their input and to make sure that some of those recommendations are, are implemented. Um, I think it's also as a leader uh, that you it's important to take uh, to look for best practices that are occurring across the country. Uh, we can learn from other places about how they've implemented these kinds of programs and the difference that it's made in helping people to integrate people of color, to integrate into the greater society and also to feel empowered um, in running for office and doing other things that are important. Um, I also think that um, Washington County should invest more in nonprofits. We don't have that many nonprofits here in Washington County, and I think that uh, as county, as as government uh, employees, we can't always reach the people that need to be reached. So use the nonprofit sector. Uh, we're there to do the work that you can't do or don't have the time to do, or don't have the connections to do. I think all of those things would help in terms of implementing um, the, the recommendations that are important to you as, as Washington, Washington County. Uh, lastly, I think that um, as leaders that you should take risks and um, be entrepreneurs, as I mentioned earlier, in government, because um, I think that it's the workers, the employees, who will make the difference in moving this forward. There you go. Um, I, would, I would say two things. One is, um, you know, capacity building is critical in so far as, um, you know, we can do a lot more together than we can do alone. It's a simple adage. But, you know, the, I'll give you, the, going back to the example of Coley Park that I mentioned earlier, it's a $14 million park that uh, we, our organization, raised $8 million for. So the city got a park, tra transformed a landfill, an environmental justice issue, uh, for, you know, a, a pretty good, a pretty good deal. And so I think that it took the deep capacity of our organization, though, to be able to secure 48 different sources of funding for that project, to get 70% minority and women contracting on that project, to involve over 1,200 community members in the project, to get two awards. You're getting the idea, right? <laughs> so um, 13 years as an organization, small and large investments from our public partners. So whether that was the city or the county or Metro, um, it adds up. And so I would say to all of you, find ways at the project level, at the higher, you know, higher levels, large and small, to make that investment every single day with a partner and to build that partnership, you know, build the capacity of Apano to serve a API folks over here, build, continue to build the capacity of Centro. And I'll speak selfishly, we're, we're wanting to open uh, a location here on the west side uh, sometime in the next 18 to 24 months. So I think the opportunities are there. It's the creativity to stop and say, we're doing something, any kind of project. How might we invest in a partner organization out in the community serving some of the racial justice communities that are, have been denied the opportunities um, and, and ask us how to do that? Don't, don't feel like you have to figure it out on your own because there's, there's some... E you can see the eagerness and the excitement, and of course the capacity there um, needs to be built. Now, and the last thing I'll note is hustle. Don't waste time. Don't you know really get moving on this um, because the communities are starting to uh, and continue to build our political power. Um, and you know we were one of the agencies that worked really hard on the Portland Clean Energy Initiative that passed by a margin of 65 percent recently, raising 30 million dollars a year annually for climate investments in low-income and people of color communities. That was led by organizations with mainstream environmental organizations supporting us, dozens and dozens of faith institutions, good government institutions, so very broad. So I would just say hustle and start to build those relationships and they can pay off in more ways than one going down the line. Yeah, I, I think as, um, as a community-based organization, I think we deal with, I, I imagine a lot of people here have like outreach in their titles or in their job descriptions, right? And so the way in which we go about talking to the people that we think we're serving is really important, right? We want to make sure that 
um, it's not extractive, right? That it doesn't just, we sat you down, we took like, we had people open up about really deep experiences. I know that was my, in case in the research groups I was in part of, right? That we're really talking about um, some things that some folks probably wanted to, to bury so they can continue on with their life, but we brought it out and we talked about it because we want to make things better to make sure people don't experience those negative things again. So for us, like uh, what Tony was saying, the clock is ticking, right? This report has already been a two-year project. You think about some people have already been talking about this for two years. The report's been out since June, right? And uh, granted, we know that like really big changes take time, but um, we want to make sure that it's a two-way conversation the entire time, right? That you didn't, we didn't parachute in, grab a bunch of people's uh, information, pat ourselves on the back, go on a speaking tour, and then that's that, right? Because that actually sets us back years in terms of the trust building that's required to actually move uh, move issues, right? Um, so I would say, like, we we should be thinking about what does the 2019 tour back to community look like, right? What are we saying that we've done, right? Um, even if it isn't too much, we need to be be there and talking to people, right? And I think that's where community-based organizations can really help because we're talking to people in a way on a consistent basis um, through elections, through uh, through legislative session that uh, can really build trust. Um, and like, we just need to, even if we we just need to like ask the questions for people because if we don't ask, we've already made a decision for them, right? If we think every time that, oh, people won't care about this issue or they haven't uh, previously come out to, to voice their opinions that we somehow, we should, we should be doubling our resolve, right? Um, if you, uh, you know, we, we were really steeped in the elections and you look down to the level of like it's unprecedented historic levels of engagement, right? Um, across the state on some really important issues, right? Um, on you know immigration, on uh, healthcare, right? That was on the ballot, and people came out and voted, right? And that and that's one of the ways in which we know government views and tracks if people are paying attention. So there's that momentum, and we can't lose it. And we should really think be thinking about how we bring more people into into civic life, right? Into being engaged with their community because they have great ideas, uh, they have solutions. We just need to be able to have enough trust that people will continue to work with us, right? And that, that applies for community-based organizations, that applies for the government, so we should work together on that front. Um, so yeah, I'm going to um, sort of club your potential response with, with a question that uh, you know want, wanted to ask you as the county representative here, which is um, just uh, you know tell us about what are the county's commitments to the call to action. Just keep you know thinking about sort of your response around you know this bringing in this approach of like how does the government deal with the nothing about us without us mm -hmm. approach and the county's power and role uh, given all that has been said. Absolutely. I would ask all of us to keep that in mind as we think about how to implement the calls to action here. Um, so what I would say about um, how Washington County is moving forward, obviously this meeting is an important first step. Um, this is a chance for all of us to ground ourselves in the report, make sure that we um, are able to hear from our experts as we move forward with figuring out how to take the calls to action to the next step. Um, when Maria and Shweta came and spoke to our Board of Commissioners in work session, um, Maria lifted up two of the calls to action in particular for them to pay attention to, and I lift those to you as well. Um, Number two was the first one she lifted. I hope I'm getting these right, Maria, so you're going to have to correct me if I'm wrong. But she, my memory is she lifted number two, which um, says that de democratic governments should collaborate with one another, redress lack of representation at all levels and spaces, and build partnerships and accountability with communities of color. And we've heard clearly from our community partners here about the, the need to do that more effectively here in Washington County. And then the other one was number six which is to make space for communities of color to run, vote, be elected, and supported in leadership, and that civic engagement needs to be inclusive of citizens and immigrants alike. And both of these recommendations, both of these calls, um, speak to the fact that communities of color face additional barriers to participation with public sector organizations like ours. So it means we need to step up our efforts to ensure that communities of color are um, able to effectively engage with us. We particularly need to look at how our implicit bias may be affecting um, the services we provide, may be uh, creating barriers without us even intending to do so. Those barriers could be at the individual level, 
either through the customer service we provide or it could be at the organizational level through the way our systems work. And we need to be looking at both of those levels. So I want to highlight a couple of actions that we're taking right now, uh, realizing that this is just first steps. So first, with some externally facing work, um, we have uh, st stood up a new civic leaders program. How many of you all are aware of that program, the new civic leaders? OK, some but not everyone. So we got to get the word out about this a little bit more. This was a new program last year that we did in partnership with Adelante Mujeres. Um, we had 20 folks go through a training cohort. And um, we're going to be stepping up our second cohort this next spring. Um, already, the first pilot cohort is applying to our boards and commissions, getting more involved with our CPO program. So we encourage departments to look for ways to include the, this trained cohort of civic leaders in the work that you all are doing. Second, um, some internally facing work that we're doing. Uh, the county administrative office recently convened a, an, a small advisory group. We're calling it a think tank. We have a number of folks in the room who are serving on that think tank for us that is looking at ways to deepen the county's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's focused specifically on uh, internal operations related to HR and procurement. So they're working on a framework that we will be able to then um, roll out to a broader organizational um, uh, involvement here over the next year. So you'll be hearing more about that as, as Think Tank starts to stand up that work. Um, many of our departments have uh, racial justice as part of their strategic plans. Um, I would say just about everyone I see in here uh, has, has that lens as part of it. Um, and so most of our planning processes um, are already incorporating some of those ideas, although I would challenge all of us to think about how to do, it, do that more effectively. Um, I will say, too, that our, um, the, some of the suggestions we've heard from panel members about increasing capacity of our nonprofit partners, especially our culturally specific nonprofit partners, is a good challenge to us. I think we provide um, support for them uh, at the departmental level, and we're starting to have more conversations across the organization about how we can partner across departments so that we're able to support our nonprofit partners even more effectively. Um, Amanda Garcia Snell, there she is, our community engagement manager, is trying to lead some of those conversations. So I encourage you to touch base with her. And I know she's having conversations already with some of your department directors about that, about how we can do that more effectively. Um, and then finally, uh, in work session with our Board of Commissioners, Maria suggested, recommended that we look at the idea of having a board-appointed advisory board that, um, uh, that's made up of communities of color. And so we are looking at uh, that concept. We've been directed by the board to bring that concept back to them for their consideration. And um, again, Amanda and community engagement is looking to develop that idea. Um, I would greatly appreciate any uh, recommendations that you all have from us about how to package that, how we should put together that concept for our board as we develop it. Yeah, um, we definitely have a little bit of time to um, to talk about that. And I would uh, love to sort of frame it as, um, you know, you all have been doing this work for a, for a while. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, what, um, uh, so in terms of this advisory committee uh, that uh, the county staff is sort of putting together, looking back at your work, sort of best practices, also, like, what have been big red flags that you would caution them uh, about avoiding? You know, th these kind of solutions are sort of rife with sort of prospects of tokenization and, you know, sort of window dressing. So I'm, I'm curious about, um, you know, uh, not all three of you need to respond, but if you do have sort of best practices or red flags uh, to uh, to avoid type of uh, suggestions around this advisory committee creation. Well, um, in my work and my experience, I have some, a couple of red flags. One of them is to be clear about the expectation. Uh, I have been involved in several um, uh, boards or committees where 
the impression is given that the input you give us will be implemented. And that isn't always the case. It was more of an advisory, give us some ideas and we'll use what we can and we'll just take your information and kind of use it and maybe not. And it, it's really created some problems for communities who come together expecting that their voice will be heard and will be implemented. It's not, so making the distinction of whether it's a policy governance type committee or is this an advisory um, input committee where you're, you're going to just, you want their input, you want their ideas and information that you're lacking to make a, a, a good decision for the community in general. I think those are there's a couple of red flags for me. Um, in terms of best practices, what's worked for me has been that um, don't just pick one person to represent one community because one person cannot represent everyone in their community. In fact, everybody's different, but um, I've seen um, at the county uh, 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 meeting, uh, they said, you know, we have all of these committees and nobody ever applies, you know, we have one position for someone to fill in with your, your community and they don't come. So that's, they're, they're not going to come. You need to give them the tools, you need to give them the information, you need to give them the big picture of how things work and why it's important that they participate because decisions are being made that impact you and your, and your family and your community and your future. I mean, all of those kinds of things need to be sent, said to the community in general, but people aren't going to come unless they're, be, they're asked. People aren't going to come unless they have the information that they need to make a decision about participating. Um, and I think that you need to um, have meetings when people can attend. Uh, some committees are in the middle of the day. Some of them are early in the morning when people are taking their kids to school. Um, if you have to do it on a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday afternoon, do that. Um, nonprofits do that. <laughs> and because we want to reach out to the community, we want to make sure that they are accessible. I think it's also important um, that you keep the numbers in, in mind. Um, if you're going, as I mentioned earlier, don't count on one, one representative from each community to give you all of the, the information that you need. Get as many people as you can from uh, communities. Um, and um, the last thing I would say is, um, to provide some sort of uh, a meal, whether it's it's uh, dinner or lunch on a weekend, or twenty-five dollars for gas, you know, because people, if they're, they're going to be committed, they're not everybody, um, you know, works from eight to five, and sometimes they need to take time off to to come to a meeting if they're really interested and, and concerned. So those kinds of things, I think, will help make it successful. Tony, Robin, any. Yeah, absolutely. To echo Maria, like lowering every barrier that you can imagine so that you actually get a true representation of the people who live in the county, right? So uh, I've been at government meetings where it's like at 8 a.m. and there's not even like coffee and you're just like, well, one, we shouldn't like, if so, if that's the case, we shouldn't like take anything from that meeting because like no one's even like alive or functioning at that point. <laughs> so it's a waste of time. But like, right, it's, 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 a, it's more than just like, it's a show of like, we understand what it takes to do this work. We also want to lower every barrier, including transportation, childcare, language translation, build that into the budget because, right? Like why should we ignore the, the, um, the, the voices that are, you know, maybe English isn't their native language or they're monolingual that's in not English because they're fundamentally a part of our county as well. And that's something that we can easily lower a barrier for, for someone who really wants to participate, right? getting interpretation, translation, um, picking times that work for folks, right? Um, increasingly in this economy, some gigs are like at off peak hours, right? They're not, like you said, eight to five. Should those people matter any less? Um, and I think when we're outreaching about what the board or the commission can do, I often see it framed as like, oh, you'll be like a board member or you'll be on a commissioner, which might persuade people, but you wanna talk about like, what you can change and like how it impacts your community. And that's the message, that's the values that you should lead with, not like here's a perk or here's a resume line. Like that may motivate some people, but it's probably not the people you want ultimately. Um, that's my opinion. And yeah, I think we just need to really utilize community-based organizations that have the trust, that are talking to folks the entire time through good times and bad. We tend to think of like when government reaches out, it's either like, legal, a fee, bad, right? Or when they reach out uh, in, a, in a positive light, we know that because of research practices in the past, like we've, a lot of folks have been there, like have been pulled into a meeting only to be like shouted down or to, you know, 
left to made feel even worse than if they didn't attend in the first place, right? Like we've had those experiences. Um, so yeah, let's like try to rebuild so that it's not just when government's calling, it's a bad thing, or it's like, we, we need your help, we need to check off a box, right? How do we continue the conversation through good times and bad, or long before a project is like slated to be decided? Because if you, if it's like, oh, we need to call an outreach meeting and this project is going through no matter what in two weeks, but we just need to make sure that we checked all these boxes, like that's not actually input, right? You're just trying to either rubber stamp or for the record say that you oppose something, but there it goes, right? So it needs to be at least early enough that people can actually halt something if they see a huge problem with it, right? And that'll save us more, that'll save us in the long term, I think, too, right? Yeah. Even some of the policies we see. So in the interest just of time. One, one thing, real okay. quick, because it's All a right. coalition thing. Yeah. I just highlight the Coalition of Communities of Color Bridges program. So this is a, creates this pipeline for leadership into boards and commissions. So it's a great uh, resource to tap into. Yes. and. Um, the Bridges is our leadership development programs. Um, cool. Um, so I think finally, I think we just have enough time for some closing remarks. And I would love, especially from the three of you, um, to um, get prescriptive. What commitments would you like to see Washington County make in terms of implementing the calls to action in this report? Um, it can be short term, long term, medium term. Could be, what can you do today? <laughs> um, so if uh, we have enough time for maybe like one or two type of, or a short spiel. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, not, yeah. So anyway. just quickly, I just um, would recommend that you own it because it's good stuff. It's good information. We've been waiting for many, many years for something like this document. Um, it's important to us as communities of color and it's, it should be important to you and I know it is. Uh, don't work in silos, invite us in, then let's do it together. Yeah, I think uh, we always talk about data disaggregation. So that narrative piece with data, making sure that folks aren't obscured or that we're not painting a huge uh, broad brush. And then uh, we mentioned the Washington, the Wa Washington County Civic Leaders Project that Adelanta Mujer has piloted. We, uh, I, I serve on that advisory committee and there, there's 20 slots and over 65 people applied this year. Amazing, right? So what are we doing with the 40 or five who can't be a part of the project? And then how can we make this a permanent funded project because there's clearly the will to, to do that, right? How can we expand it across the county? Because I think right now it's kind of based out in Hillsborough and Forest Grove, but how can we expand it, right? My, I guess my reflection is in, in terms of um, the county's role in particular is that this is about investment. And that what you see in the report is about, it, that's what disinvestment looks like whether it's whatever that is, education or criminal justice or environment, um, our communities have been systematically disinvested in. And so that leaves us with a couple recourses. One, to build our own, which we do. Uh, two, to seek partnership with those that seek to ally with us to build power. And so to me, the call to you all is, and I sense it in the room, is do you want to build power for us with us? Do you want to invest in our communities in ways that we prescribe? And if the answer to that is yes, both out of political practicality and also about a sense of righting wrongs and creating a place that is more stable for all of us because these kinds of disparities that you see in this report lead to instability in our society. And that leads to uh, all kinds of problems that usually places like counties have to end up fixing. And let's get out of that loop. And so what I reflect on here and you know, ask you all as department heads and wherever you are in health or in infrastructure or in community safety is every day when you go to work, ask yourself that question, how is this building power in communities of color? How is this leading to investment in communities of color? And if you can start to integrate that question in the work that you do every day, it, it's challenging, and but you have partners that are ready to work, um, but it also can lead to some different outcomes. And so that's the one thing I would leave you with. That was a great sort of last, uh, last word. Uh, so we have, um, and so this concludes the, the panel discussion, uh, but we have about uh, 15 minutes, uh, 12 to 15 minutes for questions about the presentation and the research project that I'm happy to answer 
as well as questions of uh, the panelists. So.